Hello, and welcome back to What Now on the Threshold of Life, Death, and Grief. I'm here in the studio with my friends and colleagues. David Kennedy. And Red Keating. And I'm Julie Brown. And tonight we have um, an interview, and um, I believe what will be a fascinating discussion, uh, with uh, Dr. Daniel Rosenbaum, who is joining us from Toronto. And we're here to talk about the role of psychedelic uh, medicine and treatment in addressing um, things like existential distress um, and as a as a new and upcoming possible treatment for people living with life-threatening illness. So before we jump into our conversation, I'm just going to do a formal introduction of Dan, and then we'll we'll jump in. So Dr. Daniel Rosenbaum is an attending psychiatrist at the University Health Network, as well as the Inner City Health Associates in Toronto. He's a clinical lecturer in the Department of Psychology of Psychiatry at the University of Toronto. He works on the Impact Assertive Community Treatment Team at UHN, as well as the Palliative Education and Care for the Homeless, the PEACH team through ICHA. Daniel is a certified calm therapist, which is managing cancer and living meaningfully, and has received training in ketamine-assisted psychotherapy. He has also completed the Multidisciplinary Association of Psychedelic Studies, MDMA therapy training program. He's the co-founder and faculty member at the UHN Psychedelic Psychotherapy Research Group. Together with Dr. Sarah Hales and Emma Hapke, he is the co-principal investigator on the Pearl Psilocybin Assisted Existential Attachment and Relational Therapy Research Program. Pearl is a novel psychedelic assisted psychotherapy for patients with advanced disease and their caregivers. Daniel is also interested in the mental health impacts of the climate crisis. So welcome, Dan. Yes. Thank you so much for having me. It's a pleasure to be here. Yeah. That Sorry, that introduction is a mouthful. <laughs> it, is. it is. Well, you can tell. I had a hard time getting it out of my mouth a few times. That's a lot to say. Have you heard of AF? It's a medical a medical thing, AF. What's that? No. Acronym no. fatigue. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> sorry, yes. sorry. Yep, there are lots the of that. The alphabet speech. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> that keeps everybody wondering. Um, so Dan, I'm going to kick it off. Um, and I would normally not read this, but I'm going to try to read this because the question is sort of multifaceted or, or a long question with, with a lot of components. So uh, I don't want to get it wrong. Uh, but in order to give our audience a, a context and, and a base upon which to begin our conversation, uh, I'm wondering if you can give us a, a bit of a history of psychedelics and, and the research that was taking place you know, back in the 50s and 60s. And then that research was interrupted. And so the forces that interrupted that research. And then how have we come to this place now? What's brought us to this place where we're sitting here talking about it, <clears throat> where you're doing research in the field um, and it's being it's sort of more out there in the general public as 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 a possible uh, use in palliative care? Okay, great question. Lots of ground to cover. I wonder if it might be important actually um, before getting into that story, I will tell a story um, to offer a definition um, so that people are able to hold in mind um, just what it is we're talking about when we talk about psychedelics. Um, so that, there's an interesting story about that word itself, actually, and the, the etymology psychedelic um, from the Greek refers to something that is mind manifesting, psyche being mind and delos being to manifest. And the word was coined out of an exchange between Aldous Huxley, who was an English writer and philosopher, uh, wrote, of course, Brave New World, and was one of the figures that popularized psychedelics in the West. Um, geez, I actually don't know when Doors of Perception was published, but Doors of Perception is a famous book that he wrote um, in which he recounts uh, a trip he took um, the, the first time he ingested mescaline. Mescaline is a psychoactive component of various cacti, including the peyote cactus, as well as the San Pedro cactus. Um, and the mescaline that Huxley took was given to him by a psychiatrist who was working in Saskatchewan. 
named Humphrey Osmond. And they struck up a, a, a lifelong friendship. Um, and there's a, a beautiful um, uh, compendium, if that's the right word, of letters that they exchanged, um, uh, compiled in a book called Psychedelic Prophets. And in any case, at the time, um, uh, drugs like mescaline were referred to as psychotomimetics. That was sort of the, <clears throat> the chemical um, classification of these drugs, um, meaning drugs that mimicked psychosis. And there was a recognition that when people took things like mescaline or LSD, also known as acid, um, they had experiences that, in, uh, that it resembled the experiences of people with psychotic illnesses hence psychotomimetic. Um, but of course, there was also a recognition that these drugs produced states or experiences that were a whole lot more than that, or perhaps different than um, a quote unquote pure psychosis. Experiences deep with personal meaning and spiritual significance. And so these philosophically minded um, explorers of this sort of terrain um, tried, were trying to think about what a more appropriate name would be. Um, and after some back and forth, they landed on psychedelic. Um, and there's a, a very famous couplet, a rhyming couplet that emerges from this exchange. Maybe you've heard before. Um, uh, to fathom hell or soar angelic, just take a pinch of psychedelic. <laughs> so there's obviously quite a lot there. Um, and I've already made reference to a few different drugs, mescaline, LSD. One of the drugs uh, or medicines I'll be talking a lot about today is psilocybin, um, which is the psychoactive component of about 200 species of mushrooms belonging to a certain genus called psilocybe. Um, and those three, along with a couple of others, constitute a, a class of molecules or medicines um, that we refer to today as the classic psychedelics. They are grouped together because of their shared pharmacologic activity. Um, they all um, exert their primary effects mainly via action at a specific subtype of serotonin receptor. Um, so that's called the, the 5-HT2A receptor. Um, now, other drugs that you might see discussed at a psychedelics conference, which have different pharmacologic activity, would include things like MDMA, um, aka ecstasy or molly or M. <clears throat> uh, MDMA um, may be better classified not as a psychedelic, but as an empathogen, in other words, something that, um, that creates or evokes empathy, or uh, it's also called an intactogen. Intactogen means um, to, to touch within or to feel within. Ketamine is also um, a drug that you might hear discussed in the same breath as other psychedelics. And the, the sort of broad category, the umbrella term of psychedelic, really refers to a certain kind of experience that can be brought about by all of these drugs or each of these drugs when administered at certain doses under certain conditions. So that's a long introduction, a long um, series of definitions, I suppose. As far as the history goes, um, as you might imagine, there's a, a thousand stories you could tell. Um, and different versions you might get um, uh, with different uh, durations of podcasts. So I will tell one and try to be relatively um, concise. It's actually, it, it's really important. Most of the um, stories I've alluded to so far have been um, stories of Westerners, um, when in fact, it, it's critical that we acknowledge that psychedelics have been used by certain indigenous communities in many parts of the world for uh, perhaps millennia. And they were not called psychedelics, of course. Um, they might have been called plant medicines. Um, another phrase that you'll see used is the, is the phrase entheogen, um, which means to produce the god within or producing the god within. Um, and different groups have had and still have different ways of working with these kinds of medicines, often used in ceremonial contexts, um, sometimes for healing purposes in a way that's analogous to the ways in which psychedelics are being studied and employed um, at this moment, 
um, but also for spiritual purposes, rites of passage and things like that. Um, and the reason it's also important to, to acknowledge this history is that um, to some degree, the, um, the wisdom traditions um, that have been brought to bear on the use of these plant medicines, sacred medicines for many of these communities, are being borrowed, if I can say, um, used, in some cases, appropriated, um, and even commodified um, in this current psychedelic renaissance. And so th there's a, an important critical discourse to be aware of, whereby um, we, we honor and express gratitude for, um, for these uh, knowledges, these traditions, while also uh, being really mindful to um, ways in which we, we shouldn't, we mustn't generalize or essentialize, and especially um, appropriate and commodify. So these are, there's some tensions in the field at this moment about these kinds of things. Um, one story you'll often hear about the history of psychedelics in the West um, uh, is located in the Oaxaca region of Mexico. Um, it was there in the 1950s that a, a, a Western banker named Gordon Wasson, um, who worked for uh, JP Morgan, maybe it wasn't called JP Morgan at the time, but in any case, a banker, um, and his mycologist, amateur mycologist wife, um, Valentina, traveled and participated in, um, in a, a ceremony with psilocybe mushrooms under the guidance of a quite a now renowned um, curandera or medicine woman uh, by the name of Maria Sabina. And um, there's conflicting reports about this, but it's thought that this was at least one of the first times that Westerners participated in these kinds of sacred ceremonies. Um, and after the experience, um, Wasson returned back to America and wrote an article for Life magazine called In Search of the Sacred Mushroom, or In Search of the Magic Mushroom, excuse me, hence the phrase magic mushroom. Um, so this is noteworthy for a couple of reasons. One, um, it remains the most widely read article in Life magazine's history. And two, um, it was written and published um, expressly against the wishes of Sabina. Um, and it led to a wave of tourism. Um, Westerners flocked to that region of Mexico, you know, in search of the magic mushroom, wanting to have the experiences that Wasson portrayed in the article. Um, and, it, and it caused quite a lot of problems in the community. And so there, there are modern day echoes of this kind of thing um, in, in the area of ayahuasca tourism. I'm realizing I didn't mention ayahuasca before. Um, Again, lots of tangents, so I'll try to be brief. Ayahuasca is um, a, a brew that um, is derived and used in the Amazonian jungle um, by different communities. Um, and it is a brew that contains um, typically a combination of plants. Um, one of those plants contains a psychoactive uh, medicine called dimethyltryptamine or DMT. DMT is a very potent psychedelic. Um, fascinatingly, DMT when consumed orally is inactive. It's inactivated by an enzyme in our gut called monoamine oxidase. Um, so when the shrub that contains DMT is combined with a vine that contains an inhibitor of that enzyme, the brew produces very powerful psychedelic effects. Um, and so anyway, I digress. Um, the the uh, Sabina story is one that you'll hear, um, you know, in Michael Pollan's now famous book. He refers to Maria Sabina and his um, the television program by the same name on Netflix. I guess How to Change Your Mind. He talks about this story. Um, the the next part of the story about the popularization of psychedelics in the West, um, where I like to go, is um, to Switzerland, where. Um, Actually, earlier than this, in the 1940s, a Swiss chemist working at a pharmaceutical company called Sandoz um, named Albert Hoffman synthesized lysergic acid diethylamide, or LSD, um, and he was not intending to, um, to synthesize a powerful psychotropic medicine. Um, rather, this was something um, manufactured or created serendipitously. And he took some of it on his own um, and then um, biked home. And, um, you know, this has become quite infamous, his bicycle trip. Um, I think it's April 19th, 
now is celebrated as Bicycle Day because, of course, his discovery um, did change the course of history, I think it's fair to say. Sandoz began manufacturing LSD. It was thought early on that one of the uses of LSD would be um, for clinicians to take the medicine so that they could better understand the experiences of disturbed patients that they were caring for. Um, but once again, um, it was recognized that um, that LSD had other kinds of properties and potential uses, and people began to explore the potential therapeutic uses of LSD. And so in the 50s and 60s, um, LSD and then eventually psilocybin were studied. Um, thousands of published research papers, um, tens of thousands of patients were administered these substances, mostly, well, for a variety of clinical indications. Excuse me. Um, but uh, what seemed to be some of the most promising indications at the time were addiction, primarily alcohol use disorder. And there were some trials here in Canada for LSD uh, um, in conjunction with psychotherapy for the treatment of alcohol use disorder and to support people um, facing death and dying, which you know, we'll talk more about, of course. Um, for the most part, the results of these studies were very promising. And for the most part, the participants in these studies um, uh, took the medicine and were, um, were treated in a very safe manner. And that's despite um, quite different standards when it comes to clinical research, quite different methodological standards at the time. And then something happened. There was a, a decades long freeze out on the research. And you might think that that, that had to do with um, significant concerns about the safety, of these medicines or that there was really nothing there, you know, not worth studying, um, where, you know, there, there were certainly some methodological concerns um, and um, certainly some adverse effects. But the story that, um, that I find persuasive is that once the medicines um, escaped the lab, so to speak, um, and um, psychedelic use was, uh, became more widespread, it became associated with hippiedom and the 60s counterculture movement, um, which uh, was also associated with anti-Vietnam War sentiment, um, the counterculture really, uh, which led to Richard Nixon calling Timothy Leary, uh, the Harvard psychologist, the most dangerous man in America. So if you think about that for a moment, this was um, a you know, disgraced <laughs> uh, psychologist who was um, espousing the virtues of LSD to the masses. Um, and the president called this person the most dangerous man in America. Um, fun fact, Leary was jailed at one point in the cell directly next to Charlie Manson. Um, so in any case, uh, the medicines became scheduled and they became illegal, which effectively meant it was impossible to study them. Because I mentioned Charlie Manson, I feel like I should also say, uh, um, there was a dark history of psychedelics for sure. Um, psychedelic use, including LSD, um, uh, it, it was used in certain cults um, and uh, there was an important role of LSD in the Manson family murders. For example, uh, the CIA uh, was giving LSD to people in um, e experiments, which decades later were um, looked back upon as torture. Um, so th this is, it's, it's not, it wasn't all peace and love. There, there really were um, some quite dark and dangerous things happening with, uh, with psychedelics at that time. If we skip ahead a couple of decades, um, we get to the second wave of psychedelic research, which um, some people would say we're in now. It's also being referred to as the psychedelic renaissance. Um, some of this work began with studying DMT, dimethyltryptamine. Um, this was in uh, uh, New Mexico, <clears throat> Rick Strassman, um, and then um, Roland Griffiths, who recently deceased, I should say, um, a, an experimental psychologist at Johns Hopkins, began studying psilocybin and initially began providing it to healthy volunteers to study its effects. Um, and there's some fascinating papers that emerge, um, dose response relationship papers, but also exploring the experiences um, that, that so-called healthy normal people have on psilocybin. And these are in, in experimental conditions. Um, the drug is given in a laboratory with two guides. Um, the participant wears eye shades, uh, wears headphones, a playlist of carefully selected music runs through. 
And under blinded conditions, in other words, the person doesn't know that they're going to be taking psilocybin. Um, they, they're aware that they are going to receive a drug. They know that it might be a range of drugs. So under these blinded conditions in the hospital setting, um, what Griffiths and his team found was that quite reliably psilocybin can um, can occasion experiences that people talk about in terms of the mystical, in terms of the sacred or the transcendent, and experiences which people quite reliably report or rate as being among the most personally meaningful of their lives or among the most spiritually significant of their lives. Um, the kinds of experiences that people talk about in the same breath as they might the birth of a child or the death of a loved one. So this is a really remarkable finding. Um, and this was uh, this these studies paved the way for what is now an explosion of clinical research, basic science, social science, um, huge amount of excitement about different kinds of psychedelics in conjunction with psychotherapy to treat different kinds of mental disorders, neurological disorders. Uh, I mean, you name it, and at the moment, someone is considering studying it, um, uh, some form of psychedelic therapy. Um, so with that, so and then I, I promise I'll wrap up. Um, I will just say um, we've seen in recent years the springing up of research programs like ours at UHN in Toronto, um, at you know prestigious universities all all over the world, Imperial College in London, and Johns Hopkins, as I mentioned, uh, UCSF, NYU. Um, at the same time, there's been an explosion of commercial interest in psychedelics, um, lots of uh, nascent psychedelic pharmaceutical companies, a huge amount of media attention. It feels like almost weekly you'll see an article um, in a national newspaper um, or international news about you know the promise of psychedelics to address uh, the current mental health crisis and, and so forth. Um, and that hype has been productive in the sense of drawing lots of um, money into funding research trials. Uh, I think the hype is also at this point probably outpaced the state of the research evidence. Um, and there's a danger to the hype as well in the sense of people coming to view these still experimental um, interventions as a panacea or something that is potentially going to solve all their problems um, when, you know, that's that's not the case. Um, and so, I you know, I'm wearing my um, my clinician researcher responsible hat here and, and just wanting to offer a disclaimer that despite all the exciting stuff I just said, um, you know, we don't um, advocate that people, for example, stop their current treatment and, and go and, and self-medicate with a handful of mushrooms. Um, rather, there's still lots we need to learn and, and lots we still need to be careful about as we, as we approach this research. Whew, okay, that was a long one. But thank, I mean, thank you. I find it fascinating. It's it's fascinating to hear about the history because not only did you give us the history, you also just kind of gave us an overview of psychedelics. And I, I think that's really important because when people think of something like LSD or we hear ketamine or we hear mushrooms, we think drunks and we think, um, and you know, and we also are living during a time, Dan, where we do have a crisis around certain kinds of drugs, very different kinds of drugs on our street with our opiate crisis. So I, I do think it's important for us to have some context around that. So thank you. I also think it's important um, because you, you gave us a sense that this isn't something that's only been around since the 50s and 60s. And I think it, it is important for anybody who has traveled in the world and seen cultures and that those indigenous cultures this this is part of of our human history in many many ways uh, that that is around the the sacred the spiritual the ceremonial um, incorporated into various cultural pieces. So I think I, I appreciate that 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 this is a, a much wider context than just mm -hmm. oh this showed up in the fifties and sixties in the hippie culture. Mm -hmm. Can you take us to some of the work that's being done, the investigations in the clinical trials around the role of psychedelics around existential distress? And maybe one of the places we should start with is even just talking about what is existential distress um, as it relates to, you know, some of the topics we cover here on the podcast. <clears throat> yes, great question. Um, and actually, this is um, this was the area that really drew me to this work. 
Um, and of course, it's it's the the area of the field that excites me most, and that I'm most directly involved with. And if, if there's time, if, and if it's of interest, that we can talk about some of the the work that we're doing at um, at our with our research group. Um, I was a medical student at the time that Michael Pollan published an article in the New Yorker called "The Trip Treatment." Um, I didn't realize it was Pollan at the time, and um, I gather. It it became it it formed part of his now you know many times over best selling book how to change your mind. Um, in the article, he is describing the um, New York University cancer psilocybin anxiety study. Um, the the paper uh, for this study was published in two thousand sixteen. Um, and it was published concurrently with a very similar trial that was conducted at Johns Hopkins um, in the preceding years. Um, so in both studies, um, a psilocybin-assisted psychotherapy was offered to people with cancer. Um, and so um, just going back actually to where to how I came to it, at the time I was a medical student, as I said, I was interested. Um, both in palliative care and in psychiatry and not really certain about which direction I wanted to take. And um, part of what was so exciting about the, the article is the, the, um, the description of clinical work attending to um, the psychological, emotional, existential needs of people with advanced disease or people facing death and dying. When that really, um, you know, quite aside from, or in addition to all the excitement about psychedelics, it really um, stirred up an interest in me in, in this kind of clinical work. Um, and then, and then of course, there's the psychedelic side of things. Um, when we talk about existential distress, I'm, I'm aware that you've interviewed um, Dr. Chris Blake, a former uh, medical school classmate of mine uh, on this topic, or per, was it? Was it directly about existential distress? Not no, really. okay. no, no, but he certainly, it was really more about palliative medicine. And one of the things he mentioned was, you know, the area, there's so many advances in palliative medicine. And one of the things he was highlighting was, but one of the areas we still have a lot of work to do is in the area of supporting people with, with existential distress. Okay, that's right. That's right. You know, um, I'm torn between offering the sort of research-based answer about what is existential distress. You know, there's this, the construct um, that is uh, that is used in the literature as opposed to something that like is probably more relevant to clinicians and, and patients and families. Yeah, let's do that. We'll do the more plain language one, okay. Yeah. Um, some of this comes from the work of my, you know, former mentor and now colleague, Sarah Hales who's um, a, a scientist um, and psychiatrist at Princess Margaret Cancer Center in Toronto. And um, Sarah, um, some of Sarah's uh, early scholarship was around um, the needs and experiences of dying people um, and trying to, to understand the, the kind of distress that people can experience um, who have advanced disease. And um, her work formed the basis of calm therapy, which she developed with uh, with Dr. Gary Roden, also a psychiatrist at Princess Margaret. Calm, by the way, stands for managing cancer and living meaningfully. I can talk more about calm at some point if you like. Um, so within calm and, and what came out of Sarah's work were four domains, um, uh, four main kinds of challenges that people with advanced disease experience. Um, the first of which is symptom management um, and um, related to that communication with health providers. Um, so these are very practical matters which also are relevant and drive a lot of the distress um, that people with advanced disease can have. Um, at the same time, people facing advanced cancer or other life limiting illness can have significant changes in their personal relationships significant changes in their sense of, um, in their personal appearance, relationship to themselves. Um, so again, rather practical things. The other two domains that Sarah and Gary talk about um, are, are more in the, the sort of profound category. So there's the practical and the profound. Um, and, and these profound concerns um, are generally what people talk about when, um, when talking about existential distress. Things like orientation to the future, grappling with hope 
um, you know, weighed against the inevitability of the, the reality of um, impending death? What does it mean to be facing mortality? And related to these things are questions about sense of meaning, um, sense of purpose, and the, the spiritual experience um, that, um, or the spiritual experiences that, that might be common to people facing death and dying. Um, so the, the latter two, again, as I said, are sort of some of the profound concerns, the kinds of things that people can talk about, um, that people refer to when, when talking about existential distress. Um, I think it's important to mention as well, and probably anyone who works clinically with, um, with people in palliative care and their families um, would would have considered this idea that, or, or at least posed the question, considered the question about whether existential distress is um, a pathology. You know, is it is it necessarily a sign that someone has a, a brain disorder? I would say probably not. Um, does it mean that someone um, is um, that someone struggling is indicative of um, a mental illness? Again, I would say probably not. I think I think we would suggest that existential distress, these kind, this kind of distress that, that is common to people with advanced disease, is normative to some extent. That these are expected emotional, spiritual, psychological challenge, challenges. Um, and just because it's normative doesn't mean that it's in, um, not incredibly painful or incredibly challenging, what it does mean is that people can use support. People tend to benefit from interventions that, um, that attend to these dimensions of human experience. So all, all that is to say, I was trying to, to set up this point that um, when Chris talks about um, the fact that when people say that there are not necessarily great treatments for existential distress, um, sometimes what people talk are talking about is the fact that um, common treatments for depression among patients with cancer have been shown to be of questionable benefit. So common medications, for example, the SSRI class of antidepressants, the selective serotonin reuptake inhibitors, uh, it, it's unclear if they are really addressing um, existential distress among people facing death and dying. We do know that a number of evidence-based psychotherapies have been developed to support people with these kinds of challenges. Um, Meaning-centered psychotherapy, for example, um, various kinds of group therapies, um, I won't be able to name them all, and perhaps, um, perhaps you and your listeners will know um, others. Calm therapy, I can't help but but mention again, um, developed in Toronto, um, a brief individual psychodynamically informed therapy um, that we we are now combining with psilocybin, um, and that's that's um, where the name Pearl comes from. So the the same theoretical underpinnings of calm therapy. Are what we're drawing on and what, what we've used to design this um, this novel intervention, PEARL, which I'll repeat again. Um, it's kind of a mouthful. Psilocybin-assisted existential attachment and relational therapy. Okay, how am I doing? <laughs> You're doing great. And even I, I even when I read your bio, Dan, I loved the part. I loved that it was the existential attachment and relational because that is so often the work to do that we do with people during um, the journey around existential distress is our attachments, our bonds, our relationships, and including the relationship to self, to our spirit, you know, spiritual beliefs, and then of course our relationships with with others too so that i don't know if that's if that's what you were getting at but it but the acronym made sense to me yeah that's that absolutely right and that was really well said um sarah talks better than i do about mortality as an attachment crisis yes. a relational crisis and so yes the attachment there is with respect to attachment theory um uh, wherein the, the recognition of impending death of mortality 
can can activate the attachment system that's right. um, and can be really disruptive to um, close relationships with the affected yeah. person. And, so any and you know, of, oh, and sorry, we hear ahead. that. Oh, I was just going to say, we hear that from people that often one of the things they're most grappling with is the idea of that attachment being severed by by death, right? The, uh, and people will so often say it's not it's not the death that I fear as much as the leaving or the departing mm -hmm. from my children, from my spouse. And so that yeah. is, and that is so much of the distress that you see coming forward. Yeah. So that makes sense to me. And that's absolutely, that's my experience too, is that often, and that's the way it often gets expressed. You know, I'm not afraid of, I'm not afraid of death or dying, but I am, I'm, I'm really, can't get over this what's going to happen this leaving this separation <clears throat> and the attachment piece that really comes into it and i <laughs> i was thinking red of of your your talks there a while ago about terror management and you know the way that, that the other ways in which we attempt to deal with that 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 uh -huh. angst uh -huh. that's what's reassuring about this whole topic in this field of research is that it is um uh, adding the other part of the human experience to the equation, you know, the physical cancer piece movement, research and treatment and all kinds of different things that we can do uh, in terms of, of addressing that particular issue. Uh, but, you know, the person is where the cancer lives and it's the person who's experiencing that whole process. Um, and, and we are more complex sometimes uh, than, than, than we're aware. And uh, I like the fact that this is sort of taking the emotional, spiritual, uh, you know, who we are as human beings, the I, um, into this versus just my body. Mm -hmm. Me too. Makes me think of the medical, medical anthropologist Arthur Kleinman talks, uh, distinguishes between disease and illness. At least I think it's Kleinman. Um, okay. Disease being, you know, the process that is acting at the level of the body, let's say, um, whereas illness is is the, the, the person's experience with disease. And I, th I think that's what you're getting at, Red. I, anyway, I think you've actually probably you you, you did that I, much better than I did. Oh, I fumbled through, but that's exactly what I meant. That that you know, there's there's that sense of of there's there's a there's a small I in here. There's a person, um, and and that. And this experience of, of cancer and treatment is happening to me as a person. And I'm not just me. I'm attached to a whole bunch of other people that are significant, important in my life. Um, and I might have some thoughts and feelings about that. And this sort of feels like that's an attempt to help people address that who are really struggling. And I think that's what I think that's what Chris Blake was uh, <clears throat> was getting at when he was talking about the, you know, that we, we have more work to do in this side of, mm -hmm. of the equation. And um, so this is it, it's, you know, I think for our listeners, people listening, there's a there's a huge understanding of of that as being such an important part of this of this piece, and not just for the person who has the, the disease, the life threatening, but the family as well. I mean, they, they, their yes. their existential angst about this mm -hmm. experience is is important, too. And we have to pay attention to them. Mm hmm. So can we can we go to now what are we finding in the area of psychedelics based on what we know in the clinical trials the research so far what is it telling us about how it works on that activation of the attachment system of this distress we have around the relational pieces these things that we're talking about Dan Okay what are we questions. hearing some questions I should say that the field is actively exploring and for which there are no at least as of yet consensus answers in other words the um, potential mechanisms through which psychedelic assisted therapy might help people or seems to has shown promise to support people with existential distress um, with serious illness um we're still working on it <laughs> hopefully we'll have more hopefully i'll have more to say at some point in the future but um perhaps i can back up and, and give an overview of this sort of subfield of, of psychedelic assisted therapy in palliative and cancer care um so in the first wave of research this is you know in the 60s 
um, and somewhat beyond. Um, there were a handful of studies, a few hundred patients, um, most of whom had advanced um, or terminal cancer diagnoses were, were um, treated with LSD or psilocybin or in some other different psychedelics in conjunction with psychotherapy. A tremendous book, which I like to recommend about this early phase of research is called The Human Encounter with Death. Um, and it um, it was written by uh, a Czech psychiatrist named Stanislav Grof with his then wife, Joan Halifax. Um, oh, Joan yeah. Halifax, yeah, I see, I see lots of John. nods. <clears throat> um, so it, it's quite interesting that, um, that she was involved in some of the early um, mm -hmm. phase psychedelic therapy research. Um, more recently, so starting in the 2010s, um, there have been, let's see, now six published trials of psychedelic therapy for patients with cancer. Still, actually, the, the total number of patients treated in these trials is still relatively small, um, just over 100 patients in these trials. Almost all have been conducted in the States. Um, there's one study, an open label study um, with LSD um, that was done in Switzerland. Uh, but for the most part, psilocybin is, um, is the medicine that's being used. And again, you'll have to forgive me for all of these asides, but super briefly, um, the reason LSD has fallen out of favor largely has to do with the duration of the acute experience. An LSD trip might last 10, 12, sometimes even more, um, more hours, whereas a psilocybin journey experience um, uh, typically is about six or eight hours. So a participant comes in at the beginning of the day um, some of the, you know, the final preparation um, is attended to. Uh, there um, is, are often ritual or some ceremonial elements um, on the session day. Um, and after the participant takes the medicine, um, they spend the day attended to by two therapists, um, guides, uh, and typically by the end of the day, the end of the work day, um, so let's say eight hours later, most people are coming back to ordinary consciousness um, uh, and most people are ready to go home. You know, in our studies and most of the studies that, that have been done, um, and people are accompanied home, but there's no driving on the session day and things like that. Um, but uh, psilocybin, it offers at least, you know, some structure for a work day um, where LSD would be getting into uh, well into the evening. I think that um, was an important as that was an important aside, uh, because this isn't just a trip in your buddy's basement. You know, this is structured, organized, planned, thoughtful, right? Yes, absolutely. And so this is making me think that actually before I talk about um, the results of the trials, I should speak a little bit to, um, you know, the basic components of a course of psychedelic assisted psychotherapy. Um, so, that, you know, Thanks for, for mentioning that, Red. I, I think there's a couple of important, uh, many important points to make here. Um, one is that psychedelics are being rolled out and studied not as a traditional medicine in the sense of something that um, might be dispensed at the, pharm uh, at the pharmacy and you take um, or you take repeatedly, as in the case of most conventional psychiatric treatments. Rather, um, Psychedelics are being studied in a model that's been referred to, which I've been referring to as psychedelic assisted psychotherapy. That means generally uh, one or perhaps a short number of high dose psychedelic experiences that is nested between psychotherapy sessions. Um, before you get to the medicine session, quite a lot of preparation has been done. We call these preparatory psychotherapy sessions. Generally, the model, um, the convention in the field at the moment anyway, is for two therapists to be present with a single participant for the entire duration of the intervention. So from the, from the point of assessment through to preparation, the dosing day itself, and then the follow-up phase we refer to as integration. This is integration psychotherapy. Um, that refers to from typically the, follow, the day following a psychedelic experience, work is already beginning uh, with the patient in conjunction with the therapists to make meaning together out of the experience, to make sense, to reflect on the lessons learned, the insights gained, the wisdom gained, 
and begin thinking about how those things that come out of the experience can be integrated, woven back into <clears throat> everyday life. And, and many, there, most, I would say, <clears throat> therapists in the field would identify the the meat tofu of the work, um, if you will, as being as coming in the integration phase. Certainly, the experience is meaningful and powerful. The support is absolutely essential. Um, psychedelics are known to be um, context dependent. So there's a, an important principle um, known as set and setting. Perhaps um, you are, or your listeners will have heard of that. Um, set refers to the mindset, the degree of, of preparation, the psychological orientation that one is bringing into the experience. And then the setting, of course, this is the like, you know, don't, uh, don't necessarily do this in your friend's basement or on your own, but who is around you? Are there trusted people? Are there trained people? Is it, are, are the sessions being done in a supportive physical environment? But generally, the, this, the, um, these sessions are not taking place in a standard hospital room, but rather something more like a hospice kind of environment, something that is comfortable, um, you know, dimly lit, not fluorescently lit. I talked about the, the eye shades and the headphones. That's actually an important point as well, which, which you know, maybe um, people who are um, new to the field may not appreciate that when we talk about a, a psilocybin session, even though we're talking about psychotherapy, the session itself is inward, it's inner directed. So for the most part, um, people are not talking to the therapist during the experience. The general orientation, um, and this is part of the preparation um, that we provide to patients, is that um, the experience is primary. In some ways, it, you know, it can be thought of it as a, a deep meditative kind of experience, one that lasts many hours and in which lots of fantastical stuff can happen. Um, but, but generally, we're encouraging people to go in, to follow the unfolding experience, to be curious about what arises, whether it's... Um, dark and scary, which can happen. These experiences can be terrifying, can be deeply painful, can also be um, immensely cathartic. Lots of emotional release can happen. Um, or the experiences can be um, ecstatic. Um, people can experience um, transcendent um, joy, um, love, cosmic love, universal love. I mean, some of the language that participants use um, to describe their experiences is just so evocative and moving. Um, but again, these are inward experiences. Um, the principle is that experience is first and interpretation or sense making comes later. There's lots of time for that in the aftermath and that is critical, but really we're, we're wanting to prepare people to have a, a deep inward experience. So um, I think that's a fair summary of you know what the intervention in its sort of um, bones looks like that, that's like sort of basic prep session integration model of psychedelic therapy um, and you know in case people are interested um, in the clinical studies generally a dose of 25 milligrams of synthetic psilocybin is used it's hard to compare synthetic psilocybin this is you know pharmaceutical grade um to the the dose of dried mushrooms that that people might take or have taken for a long time but um in case it's of interest or for reference probably around three to five grams of dried mushrooms so, so th these are these are really you know big doses um and it, it's critical that people um are supported or trust is established with the therapist where there's good rapport where people have a sense of you know not just bodily safety but psychological safety when they're going in <clears throat> Okay. What what um what has encouraged you in in this work? What is what is it that that you've experienced in in the patients who have undergone this that that is really encouraging to you? It's a great question. I, w I wish I could answer from direct personal experience. I can't yet actually because the the trials that we are working on have yet to um are not yet up and running. Um, so I've actually not um, overseen, I've not been a, a therapist for, for participants in this work. So I can tell you lots of that I'm excited about based on um, what I read, what appears in the literature. 
Um, there's a fantastic paper that I always recommend to people um, who are interested in this field that emerged from the NYU cancer psilocybin study. Um, that The paper that I'm talking about is called Cancer at the Dinner Table, and it's a qualitative research study. Um, a, a subset of the participants in that um, trial were interviewed about their experiences. Um, and you know the, the themes of their reports were analyzed and distilled. Um, and so I will go back um, later, if you like, and talk about some of the, the quantitative outcomes of these studies. Like what, what do the studies generally show as far as reductions in depression and improvements in quality of life and that kind of thing. Really what I'm excited about and what's what captured my interest um, and, and makes me so fascinated by this work are, are the, the participant experiences, the language people use. So the kinds of themes that emerge from participant reports, again, these are patients with cancer who, um, who've received a course of psilocybin assisted therapy. They talk about reconciliation with death, that these experiences supported by psychotherapy and by trained guides um, allow them to come to a sense of acceptance, reconciliation, equanimity, and acknowledgement of cancer's place in life. And not only that, also in the aftermath, a kind of, uh, I mean, I'm quoting from the paper here, a, a reconnection to life, a reclaiming of presence. Uh, people come to, um, people will say things like, um, after the experience, um, it's, it's not as though they lost the, the fear that they were going to die entirely or that they became deluded that they were not going to die. Um, you know, it wasn't necessarily a comforting delusion, but rather the weight of cancer was lifted. Um, they were able to, um, to continue living and take meaningful steps toward preparation for death while also not being so terribly burdened by the emotional weight of cancer. So this is one of the themes that emerges from this paper is the emotional uncoupling from cancer. In the cases where some participants whose cancers were in remission underwent the treatment, people had experiences of, um, of greater confidence in the face of cancer recurrence, people who were no longer um, so burdened by anxiety about the cancer coming back. Again, not losing the, the, the sense that that's a, a possible occurrence in the future, but rather being able to live in a reconnected way, a way, um, a, a more present way, um, you know, despite some of these realities. We are not solving the unsolvable problem of death, um, but rather th this medicine um, and these therapies seem to help people live better at the end of life and frankly, die better. Um, so putting my clinician researcher hat back on, I should say, this is at least what, um, what the studies suggest so far. So as I mentioned, a um, small number of studies conducted to date, a small total number of patients. That being said, in the studies that have been done, um, the primary outcome measures have typically involved some measure of anxiety or depression. Um, and a bunch of secondary measures that I alluded to before, like quality of life, spiritual well-being, um, death-related anxiety, demoralization, things like this. W when it comes to the primary outcomes, the studies that have been done so far, so far show rapid and robust improvements in virtually all of these domains. And again, I'm, I'm you know, simplifying to some degree. Um, but people have you know, really dramatic experiences um, and um, often really positive outcomes. I feel like maybe I'll pause there because um, I'm not sure what direction to go in next. So, you know, I'll be guided by your questions. Well, where do you want to go? Um, I think that was a good direction. I, I think that, that, you know, a description of the process and then why, if, if I'm a person, what would what would be drawing me to this if I was distressed? The fact that your findings and, and the findings that you might say initial findings are that some of the weight of having this cancer 
are is alleviated some of the distress I'm experiencing some of the issues that I'm having as an individual person about being someone dying of cancer are are, are lightened and alleviated um I mean I think that's important for people to know I had a question though about <clears throat> we've been using words like um LSD and mushrooms <laughs> and what what's the stigma is there any stigma still left around this work that <clears throat> people might be sort of leery because i mean start saying some names of chemotherapy drugs and and i i get scared but we hear mushrooms we hear lsd we hear ecstasy we go my god those are street drugs those are things that <clears throat> people take um and and so i'm just wondering is there any stigma around the research and maybe uh, some leery uh use the word leery uh people being leery about uh participating or even having the discussion great question and uh, yeah I, I got caught up in my own um long-windedness that was the, the second reason why lsds has sort of fell out of favor is not being um, studied as much in this second wave of psychedelic research it, it is related to stigma i think um um some of the the researchers like um, Roland Griffiths types at Johns Hopkins decided to um, to focus on psilocybin because it, it, there was less political baggage associated with it than with LSD. Um, so it, it, that was a kind of stigma, and you know, to some extent, the like while there's, there's hundreds and hundreds of studies being done, from a regulatory standpoint, it's still quite difficult to do research with um, with these drugs that are. You know, from a, a Canadian Drugs and Substances Act perspective, are still scheduled at like the most restricted level um, of regulation. So this, there's still this lingering stigma from you know decades ago that um, that these are, are very very dangerous drugs. That um, you know, in, in order to get an exemption to conduct research with these drugs, you, one has to have um, a safe behind two locked doors, and the safe needs to be, you know, drilled to the ground. It's like the the requirements are really like um, the drugs need to be handled, you know, like nuclear material almost. And to your point, Red, um, there are many other drugs in the hospital that are, you know, quite dangerous or quite dangerous if used inappropriately. Which leads me, I guess, to the to the notion that psychedelics are powerful tools. Um, you know, just as the scalpel is a powerful tool. Um, and if wielded irresponsibly, um, has, has the potential to cause harm. Um, and yet, when used carefully, um, with well-prepared participants, suitable participants, we even talked much about contraindications, um, has the potential to to um, alleviate um, a tremendous amount of suffering, uh, we think. So as far as some of the other stigma goes, um, I mean, I, I'm certain it exists. Um, I know that some of the trials that I mentioned um, that were conducted in the early 2010s took many years to recruit um, even a small number of patients, 26 patients in the New York study, 51 patients in the Johns Hopkins study, years to recruit a relatively small number of patients in these studies. And, and I have to think that stigma was a part of that. You know, in, in the year 2010, you come across a poster in the hallway of a hospital and it says like, come take the magic mushroom drug um, <laughs> with two strangers. Um, people, you know, are liable to think, well, that's illegal. And um, is my brain going to be like that fried egg in the pan, et cetera. Even within the last 10 or 15 years, the, the pendulum's really shifted, it seems to me. This is one of the aims of the first study that we're conducting is with respect to recruitment rates. We really don't know what to expect. Um, uh, our first study is a, a pilot trial of the of the pearl therapy intervention that I was describing. Um, we're, we're aiming to treat 15 patients. It's an open label study, so everyone will get the same intervention. And um, the, the primary objectives of, of the study are to assess um, the acceptability of the treatment. You know, do, do people think it seems to be okay for the most part? Is it feasible to do within our cancer center? Um, is it a safe intervention? And so forth, um, and you know, as part of the the feasibility, um, can we successfully recruit? So it's possible that the stigma may come up there. Um, but as far as the pendulum swinging, I mean, my I sort of alluded to the hype in my introduction that that in some ways I fear the opposite at this point. Like, notwithstanding the legal classification of these substances, that that um, that LSD and mushrooms and so forth are still legal, although 
um, have been decriminalized in, in certain jurisdictions. But in any case, um, I think the, the greater fear that I have is that um, is that people is that we will see more and more um, adverse reactions, bad outcomes, um, harm done um, in settings where um, the drugs are used irresponsibly. I think this moment um, must come with, in addition to you know carefully conducted clinical trials, um, quite a lot of public education um, and um, education about harm reduction. I um, mean, you know, we know that that people um, continue to seek these treatments out in underground settings, or as I said, self-treat. Um, and I think there's risk. Um, and maybe I mentioned this earlier of, of people, um, you know, for example, with treatment-resistant depression who have had many trials of psychiatric medications and are on a combination of medications now, and their their condition is stable, but they're not well, and they're understandably desperate for treatment, and they're hearing about all this promise, and perhaps metabolizing or taking in the message that that this is going to solve the problem, that this is the solution, and perhaps people stop their medications that really do so abruptly in an unsupervised way, um, and, and that could lead to real harm. Um, you know, the, the, the medicines themselves are, are not without risk. In, in controlled clinical trials, including with a medically ill population, like the people with advanced cancer, the drugs are all focused on psilocybin, appears to be very safe. So in all of the trials that I mentioned, you know, done since the early 2010s, um, there have been no serious adverse events um, among patients with cancer, including in some cases, you know, quite advanced cancer. Mind you, these are carefully screened patients. The trials have rigorous inclusion and exclusion criteria. Um, but from a from a physiologic standpoint, psilocybin um, is known to be remarkably safe. Most of the risk, or many of the serious risks, um, are psychological in nature. There's a notion of behavioral toxicity. Um, you, you've, people may be familiar with, you know, high profile cases of um, someone taking a high dose of this or that, potentially along with other doses of this or that, and then um, walking out of a window or causing harm to someone else or behaving in a dangerous way. So these risks are probably, um, can be mitigated to a large degree when the drugs are used in controlled settings with a lot of supervision and care and when trust has been developed with the guides and so on. What? Um, Dan, just what haven't we covered here that you think that is important? I, I, I have to say, I really agree with, you know, having followed this field, this emerging renaissance over the last couple of years, it does, I'm really appreciating what you're saying that this, the stigma may not be the concern. It may be the, uh, <laughs> It may be the way that it's being publicized as kind of the new panacea. And it's understandable that we might get really excited about something when, you know, a lot of our current treatments, as you say, somebody with treatment resistant depression is still living with um, a lot of challenge and suffering. So I can see why there is kind of this momentum building around it. And I'm really appreciating um you know, your emphasis on, but, you know, there's a way that we do this in a very kind of controlled, contained, there's a lot of components that go into, it's not merely about, oh, psychedelics are the, are the way, it's like, it's psychedelics assisted, right, psychotherapy, and that there's a whole protocol around that, where there's, a, you know, a beginning, a middle, and an end to it, so I'm um I'm appreciating your carefulness around that. Is there anything else just you know as we start to move towards wrapping up this evening is there anything else you're feeling like we've missed in this discussion that we need to be talking about? I mean as you as you probably picked up it could go on and on. Yeah. Um maybe a couple additional points about um I mean, I, I think I did allude to how important context is, um, and the reason our 
group at UHN, um, which, which um, I should say was founded a couple of years ago. We were really lucky to receive um, a large philanthropic grant that allowed us to um, to start a research group. We decided to to call ourselves the Psychedelic Psychotherapy Research Group, um, recognizing, as you just emphasized, Julie, that, um, that these interventions are complex ones. And while the psychedelic gets a lot of uh, focus um, and receives a lot of attention for, for, for interesting reasons, um, we believe that the, su the support is essential and that in some ways the psychedelic can be thought of as catalyzing a psychotherapeutic process. Um, and you know this fits with some of the emerging stories about um, from a neuroscientific perspective, what is going on when someone takes a high dose psychedelic. Um, and so without going down too long a rabbit hole, I would suffice it to say that um, it is being recognized that psychedelics um, can reopen um, what are called critical periods, um, or reopen windows of learning. So psychedelics disrupt habits which in the case of um, someone who's suffering from depression and has certain psychological habits, certain patterns of thinking, which can be very negative and unhelpful, psychedelics can disrupt those habits. And then in the aftermath of the experience, there is an opportunity for learning new ways of being, new ways of relating to others, relating to self, relating to the world. So this is where, you know, the, the essential importance of the context, it's really the, the maximum benefit of these interventions is likely to come <clears throat> when psychedelics are offered under nurturing conditions and probably also in conjunction with psychotherapies that are known to be helpful for the problem at hand. Um, and so that's part of what we tried to do when we were designing our, um, our intervention. And part of what we're so excited about is that um, Calm therapy is an evidence-based treatment for um, people suffering from depression in the context of advanced cancer. And as I said, to some extent, we, we took the important elements of calm therapy and we paired it with the, the essential principles of psychedelic-assisted psychotherapy that focused preparation, the single high-dose session, the, the integration, the meaning-making. And we think it's a nice fit um, and, and we're excited to um, to see. So we have um, a pilot study, as I mentioned. We also were fortunate to receive a grant from uh, the Canadian Institutes of Health Research, CIHR, uh, for a randomized controlled trial of the intervention. Um, so the participants will be randomized to either um, the pearl therapy, as I described it, with a high dose, 25 milligrams of psilocybin, or um, a low dose serving as a placebo control. And I won't, I won't go go into this door, but I'll just open the door of saying that um, a placebo control is a really hard thing to achieve um, because a high dose psychedelic experience um, is a, a very profound one. Um, there are you know, substantial alterations to alertness, to emotional processing, to sensory experience. Um, yeah, I mean, maybe I'll leave it there, but just to say that it's, a, it's an interesting um, topic in the field, how to d design um, high quality randomized trials. We're also um, planning to modify and, um, and pilot the intervention for caregivers of patients with advanced cancer, um, both active caregivers, in other words, people who are um, providing care to a loved one going through cancer treatment, a population of people whom I expect you know experience a very high level of distress, often as high or even higher than, than patients with cancer themselves. Um, it's a population of people who tend to disavow their own needs um, and a population who is underserved. There are not um, many services for caregivers of patients with cancer. Um, and, and we think that this intervention uh, may be useful. Um, and then finally, the other clinical setting that we're interested in is um, is grief and bereavement. Um, so we're putting some thought into what an intervention like this, what what a psychedelic assisted therapy might look like, and you know, at what point following a loss um, it, it might be useful for someone who's experiencing grief. <clears throat> 
So, you know what that all means? That means that you need to come back at some point and <coughs> g- give us an update on this work, on these pilot studies that are happening, if you would. Yeah, I'd be, I'd be happy to. Yeah. Hopefully it won't be too long. <laughs> I am delighted to hear about the the awareness around the caregiver distress and i know it's um it's a topic that we're going to cover here shortly on the podcast um but as you say like the disavowing of their own needs and i know that's often even in our roles at hospice um is that's a big part of our role is trying to support those people those folks the caregivers yeah so as we wrap up tonight, any any other questions, Red or David, for Dan? No, I'm good. Oh. I'm. This that has been a lot so, of information. Yeah, and so helpful. I appreciate it so much. Oh, I'm glad it's fun. Yeah. Okay, sorry to do this. Maybe w- just one last thing that I'll flag as of Please. interest, because I, I um, it hasn't come up, but I, I think um, you know people working in this area may be wondering about medical assistance in dying. Um, and the relevance of this topic to the MAID discussion. So, you know, a whole conversation we might have about this. Um, I think it's it's fair to say that, that research continues to show that, um, that people tend to request MAID not for um, intractable physical symptoms, not because they're in persistent pain or not because they have nausea that can't be treated, but rather for um, emotional, psychological, um, spiritual distress, existential distress. Um, and so if you put that story together with the story we told earlier about there being a lack of services for people experiencing existential distress or potentially a lack of really high quality treatments, then, um, people have at least raised the question of will psychedelic therapy reduce requests for MAID? Um, might it be a, you know, quote unquote, life-saving intervention for people who are considering MAID? Should that even be our intention in approaching the, the um, you know, the therapeutic care of people considering MAID? Uh, should that be our aim? Um, or perhaps should our aim re- really be to support people's process to try to alleviate suffering? Anyway, I think it's probably best to leave this at the level of question posing um but but i will say our our group is interested in these questions and and um uh, we're hoping to to gather data about people's attitudes towards hastened death um or whether as they entered our trial were they thinking about medical assistance in dying um did their experience shift how they were thinking about things um and so on and so forth so um, again, maybe a topic for another day. We will definitely have to have you back for that one. <laughs> that's that right. one. We could. That's a springboard, Dan. <laughs> that that I guarantee you, we could go on for a long time. But mm-hmm. thank you very much. Yeah. You yeah. can see our head nods with yeah. that, and <laughs> just suffice it to say that your, your, you and your colleagues are interested in in that kind of conversation, and the same would be true for us here. Yeah, this is a fascinating conversation. Um, I have found it fascinating and yeah. thank you. You've t- really taken us through, you've really given us a really robust understanding of where we're at right now, where we've been, where we're at right now and where we're moving forward to. So thank you so much. Yeah. And, uh, I really do hope that you'll come back at some point and, um, keep us updated. Yeah, it will do. Thanks for inviting me and, um, it'll be a pleasure to continue the conversation sometime. Thanks, Dan. Thanks, Dan. Thanks for listening to What Now? On the Threshold of Life, Death, and Grief. What Now? is produced in partnership with Hospice Peterborough. Music by Paradise Garage. Technical support provided by Sean and Jonah Heikert. What Now? is recorded at Thin Spaces Studio. You can find more episodes for free on most major podcast platforms, including Spotify, CastBox, Apple Podcasts, and Overcast. If you want to support us, please follow and leave a review wherever you get your podcasts. And tell your friends, it really makes a difference.